Welcome to the Focus on Why podcast. I'm Amy Rowlandson and I ask my guests one simple question, why? Focusing on the importance of why, I share with you the relatable, uplifting and inspiring conversations I have with people from all walks of life. This podcast will encourage you to focus on your why to enable and empower you to achieve the success you desire. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why. Today on the Focus on Why podcast, I am joined by Sylvia Baldock. Welcome, Sylvia. Hi, Amy. I'm so delighted to be here and really looking forward to having a conversation with you. Well, let's see where that goes, because with this conversation, it can go in all different directions, because when we talk about the why, or sometimes it's multiple whys, sometimes it's layers of whys, it's different for everyone because we are all unique. So let's see where your why takes us on this in this journey today. Fantastic. So why don't we start with where you are today, what you're up to right now? Yeah, so what I'm doing right now is really focusing on enabling people to become more significant. And what I mean by that is, um, well, let me just uh, take you back a, a few years when there was a quote by Oprah that just stopped me in my tracks. And it was, don't worry about being successful, work towards becoming more significant and the success will naturally follow. And it was kind of a quite a shocking statement because I'd been brought up to work hard, to do well at school, to get further education, to get the best grades possible, because then I would be successful. I'd get a good job, a career for life, and I'd be successful. So work hard to being successful was always how I'd live my life. And there was suddenly Oprah saying, don't worry about being successful work towards becoming significant. So that started me off on a real journey of discovery. And I thought, okay, what is the difference? So I decided to chat to lots of people, which I love to do. And I just researched this whole topic of success. And I I just basically approached people and said, I'm doing a bit of research. What does success mean to you? So how do you measure your own success? And when you look at other people, How do you measure their success? And the answers were very, very similar. So both for themselves and for the people that they looked at, it was, well, where do they live? What kind of house do they live in? And what kind of car do they arrive at meetings in? And what kind of clothes do they wear? Are they in designer clothes or or do they shop in the high street? And who do they hang out with? And, you know, how wealthy do they appear to be? And it was very much all the external evidence of wealth. And, and, you know, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that at all, Amy. However, what I found was that most of them said, you know, you spend your life working towards these trappings of wealth. And actually, when you find you've got that big house and you've got your top of the range car and you can afford those really wonderful holidays, there's just a kind of knowing feeling that, God, there must be more. There must be more to life than just this. And the problem with accumulation of wealth is it's really addictive. You know, you get that lovely house and then you're thinking about, oh, what if we got a bigger house and more land? And it's that constant seeking of something better to fill that hole. And what where Oprah was coming from was that being significant, it's not about the material things in life. It's about the difference you make on this planet. It's about the lasting impact you have on the people you share your life with. So the people you live with, the people you work with, your colleagues, your team. Um, It's about the positive difference you make to them and and the way you uplift and inspire them. And, you know, I very much refer to it as living your legacy. So rather than living your life, hoping to leave a legacy, that actually you're living your legacy right now. Um, So my work is all around enabling other people to see how they can become more significant. And it's funny because you, you you literally just picked me to the post there. I've just written down, ask Sylvia about living legacy, and then you just explained <laughs> it. So, but, but, but in terms of what does a living legacy look like to you and how are you sort of manifesting that? Because you talked about 
a lot of people constantly seeking the material elements and mm. they think it's going to be different for them for some way. They think that it's going to be, oh, but if I have that house, I will be happy. And, and that's yeah. where they get caught in that sort of trap, that constant cycle. Firstly, what does living leg legacy look like for you? And then what is it that really they're seeking? Great questions, Amy. So um, living your leg. Well, I'll tell you how this came about. Again, it was kind of almost a light bulb moment, although I think it was several light bulb moments. About 10 years ago, I was delivering the eulogy at my mom's funeral and she'd had Alzheimer's for a number of years. But fortunately, before she slipped into the abyss of Alzheimer's, my niece had had the foresight to interview her and had got all this wonderful, rich material and stories that I'd never heard before about my mom and her life. And I was able to use this fantastic material to really do her life justice at the funeral. And I remember afterwards, the number of people that came up to me and said, oh, I really enjoyed hearing that about your mom, but I so wished I'd known that about her when she was alive. I'd love to have talked to her about that. And it just struck me, you know, so often funerals now are celebrations of somebody's life. And that's when we really find out how they lived their life and what value they gave to the people around them and what difference they made. And I thought, isn't that sad that we have to wait till somebody's actually no longer here to find out what their unique value is? And a lot of that is tied in with us being brought up not to talk about ourselves. You know, it's rude to talk about yourself. And, you know, I remember my father saying, don't get above your station, young lady. You know, if I was talking about something I'd achieved at school and I mentioned it twice, you know, it was don't get above your station. And we're very much taught not to talk about ourselves. Um, and so a lot of people live their life very quietly, very modestly. And it's only when they've gone that you discover their true worth and the true value. So what I'm doing with people is helping them to connect to that true value so that they can start showing what is unique about them right now so that they can give the people they meet enough information so that they can make the informed decision of whether that person's right for them to work with or to recommend. So rather than hiding your light under a bushel and being really modest, it's not about being arrogant. It's about being authentic and real. This is what I do. This is how I can help you. This is what I offer. Um, and then people, as I say, can make the informed decision of whether that person is right for you. And then that's making an impact right now. And it's helping people with the natural skills that you have. And it's standing up and letting those skills show rather than hiding away under that mask of, oh, I mustn't be arrogant. And it's a fine a sort of line to tread. And a lot of people sort of don't tread it at all for fear of no. just sort of standing out too much. And and yet, you know, they, they, that they downplay their moments of or, or special abilities of, of being able to shine and it, it you know you can see it when you make a compliment to someone you say oh you look fabulous today they were all oh, this old thing you know yeah. I've had this for ages and it's so frustrating because it's just accept that special compliment accept the fact that you are able to make a difference to get to create an impact because you know being visible doesn't equal you know being but sort of invaluable it means totally the opposite it being visible means that you can create a space that encourages others to shine absolutely you know there's that wonderful quote by by Marion Williamson which you know it said you know when you let your own light shine you give others permission to do the same and you know if everybody's hiding away then that sets this feeling oh I can't possibly let people know what's special or unique about me I must just blend in and you know we're brought up to blend in from a very early age, you think when you go to school, you look exactly the same as all the other school kids. You know, you sit in the same place every day. You learn in the same way. If you try and do it differently, you're shouted down and told, do it the way you're told. So, you know, if you think back to school days, we weren't encouraged to innovate. We weren't encouraged to be creative. It was do it the way I showed you. That's the way we always do it here. And, you know, a lot of kids leave school thinking that, being innovative is something somehow wrong because each time they try and do things differently, they're told not to. They're told to do it the way it's always been done. And, you know, that's perpetuated when you go into a business and you're perhaps in a meeting and you offer an idea and you're shouted down. And again, you're told, oh, that would never work. Or no, we tried that and it was useless. And, and so, so many adults, unfortunately, think 
I'm just not creative. I'll just be quiet. I'll just shrink, you know, and I'll take action afterwards, but I won't offer the unique value that I've got. And it's so sad. And how long have you been working in this purposeful space of you know, helping people to or enabling them to become more significant? Well, probably most of my life, Amy, because um, way back when I was just uh, 12, my parents, who were strict Baptists, were asked to uh, start a church in a very deprived area of Glasgow. And after a few months of going along to this, this church, which was held in a school, and my brothers and I decided to start a youth group. And it was uh, an area called Castle Milk in Glasgow, where there was lots of drugs and uh, gang warfare. And a lot of the young people were in and out of prison. A lot of them were drug addicts or alcoholics, came from broken homes. So lots of problems. And as young as 13, I was standing on a big stage in the school hall talking about life and purpose and fulfillment and uh, just loving the fact that I could talk to these teenagers about the fact they didn't have to settle for the cruel cards that life had dealt them, that there was a whole big world out there for them to explore and to, to expand into. So way back then, However, through the course of my life, I, I met somebody when I was 15 who I fell madly in love with, and I married him at 19. And when I married him, realized I'd married a bully. And his raison d'etre was to keep me small, and I had to be the perfect little wife, agreeing with his points of view and the perfect home and all of that. And for a while, I shrank because it was so painful when I didn't. Um, and I shrank. And when I was in that really, really dark place and playing really small, I felt so insignificant. And I vowed then that when I got out of that place, what I wanted to do was to help people who had become suppressed for whatever reason to reconnect with who they are at their core and to step up and shine again. And, you know, the lesson I got from that was it didn't matter how suppressed I was and I was severely suppressed. He couldn't turn out the essence of me. He couldn't switch off that inner light that I was born with. It was just shrouded in lots of layers of limiting self-belief, but it was there. And once I started peeling those layers back, it was ready to shine again. And that's very much the message that I give to people um, who are hiding in the shadows for whatever reason, who are feeling insignificant or trying to blend into the background. Um, so there's a lot of history behind why I do what I do. And I do, you know, really passionately. And why would you say that we're still experiencing, knowing that we now have had sort of decades of personal development and the ability to, to shine from an early age, why do you still feel that or see so many people struggling with limiting beliefs? It's very much that fear of being judged. You know, we, we are so terrified of what people think of us. And, you know, I was coaching a fantastic lady this morning and she's really high up in her profession. And she's just got an amazing offer to take on an incredible job in Sydney where she can basically write her own paycheck and define her own role. And she's worried about what people at home will think about her, upping sticks and taking her family to Sydney. And, you know, that's inbred in us. It's worrying about what other people think about us and that fear of being judged and being found wanting. And, you know, our brains are wired to be to uh, for negative bias. So you will know this as a speaker. You're standing up in front of a room and 99% of that room are really engaged, but there's somebody who's sitting there on their phone, totally disinterested. That's the person you're going to focus on. And afterwards you're going to think, right, okay, that obviously wasn't very good. I didn't engage everybody. And yet we know we cannot please all the people all of the time, but we'll still focus on the negative. Similarly, if you've run a training program and you've got 10 excellence and one just good, it's that one that's just good that you'll focus on rather than the 10 excellence. It's the negative bias our brain is naturally drawn to rather than the positives. And is that essentially because we want to improve or is it a, a wanting to fit in the sense of belonging? I think it's a bit of both. I mean, one of our basic needs, as you know, is, is always to improve. But um, we so undervalue ourselves. And on the, you know, I run this six week program on becoming more significant. And in one of the sessions, I'm asking them to define what they're great at 
And people find that really difficult because, oh, I don't like saying that. I don't like saying what I'm great at. I mean, that feels really arrogant. And it's that inbred. You can't say that because that's really boastful and they're brought up not to boast about themselves. And I often say to them, well, do you know, if you're at a networking event and you've got time to do an elevator pitch and you stand up and you're just very bland, then how do people know that you're the right person for them? If you can't describe the benefits of what you offer, then you're denying the people around you the opportunity to, to gain from your experience, from your wisdom. Um, and so it's actually quite tough to shift the mindset into how you talk about yourself in a way that really helps people to understand what you can do for them and whether you're that right person for them. So it's it's real hard wiring from childhood, Amy, and that's quite difficult to shift. And it sounds to me as though you, you were actually quite fortunate to have supportive parents who did lead you to believe that you needed to work hard, but they also allowed you to have that platform to shine and, and stand out as a, a young teenager, which, you know, a lot of sort of, I would say some some upbringings may have sort of haught, sort of oh, what's the word sort of held it back or, or yes. hidden it but you were allowed to do that and but then you actually then in, sought out whether you wanted to or not so clearly you didn't that sort of relationship which actually held it back now because of that it serves you so well to have had that experience because you, you, yeah you you now can shine even brighter yeah, and as you know, when when you're speaking, if you've got, um, if you show some vulnerability and you show that you've been in that position where a lot of your audience are, that's when you get real connection. You know, because all of us can can learn. We can go on training programs. We can put together a really effective presentation, if you like, and deliver it. But if it's got no soul and no real depth and no real connection, then it can just be very, very flat. Uh, you know, and I'm a great believer when you speak, it, it's to to share that vulnerability. And actually, Amy, I know that you're part of the Professional Speaking Association. And that's one thing that I learned when I joined, because I wasn't sharing that vulnerability when I joined the Professional Speaking Association. And the first three presentations I did, the showcases, um, I didn't share my story. And each time I got, yeah, really good presentation, good content, but, but what's your story? And you know, I literally said, I haven't got a story. <laughs> and I look back now and I think, I wonder if most people think they haven't got a story. Because you know, when you hear those amazing stories of people being stranded on Everest in the last avalanche, or people that have been, you know, attacked and left for dead, or people that have been climbing and, and they've had to cut off limbs, you know, those really amazing stories, it makes you feel, well, you know, nobody's going to be interested in me. And again, that's why would anybody be interested in me? It's that kind of don't talk about yourself story again so that it's quite a mantra that we grow up with this not don't talk about yourself and it can impact you for the rest of your life and interestingly enough um I'm actually working with quite a lot of Scottish people funny enough we speak the same language but I find there's even a divide between England and Scotland in terms of people's ability to talk about themselves and in Scotland they find it even more difficult to talk about themselves and what they do and what's unique about them than people in England. And of course, I'm generalizing now, but as we know, people from America tend to find it a lot easier. It's kind of their culture. You know, they're not they're not taught to not talk about themselves. They're taught to celebrate what they've done and, and let everybody know. And yeah, let's have everybody around and celebrate your success, etc. So a lot of it's our upbringing and our culture. And that's quite a difficult thing to shift. Yeah, it's going to take certainly a few generations for it to sort of disappear for good. That that is, I can see that for sure. So, why is it that you're so passionate about the work that you do? What is your why? It's the it's the shift in people. Um, so, when when I'm working with people and I see them just open up and metaphorically peeling back those layers of limiting beliefs one by one and the light bulb moments as they realize how much more they've got to offer. And then as a result, the opportunities that come their way, because as you know, when people start to believe in themselves 
and particularly when they start to connect with you know themselves at a deep spiritual level uh, and they start to do things like meditating and they start to think about their vision for the future and they start manifesting it's amazing the magic that unfolds and the opportunities that come their way and the woman I was coaching this morning is a case in point you know this opportunity in Sydney has absolutely come about by her becoming more significant and that for me is just thrilling and watching people just emerge like that butterfly from the chrysalis. I know that's a much used uh, term, but funnily enough, I, um, I'd i like to share something. I'm, I've, I've just finished the draft of my book on becoming more significant and I did lots of research um, when I was putting it together and I did research the butterfly and the cocoon and the whole process and learned loads actually. And when that caterpillar goes into the cocoon, it digests itself. So before it goes in, it eats as much as it possibly can to get as fat as it possibly can. Then it, it spins this cocoon around itself. And then what it does, it digests itself in the cocoon. And you have this kind of soup inside. But inside these soups are cells that are called marginal discs that were already in the caterpillar. And those cells are the basis for the wings and the antennae and the other vital parts of that butterfly. And that eventually will grow and emerge. And for me, what I say to people is you have everything that you need within you to emerge as that metaphorical butterfly. It's all there. It's just a case of tapping into it, peeling back those layers that are hiding all those skills, all that uniqueness that you've got to offer and stepping into that potential that we all have, that we're all only scratching the surface of. Um, so I think that's quite a good analogy, that it's all there already. It just needs to be nurtured and, and brought out to the fore. Yeah, absolutely. And and that process of then becoming the butterfly is actually quite a messy one. You know, the, the emergence of or the birth of, of the butterfly from the chrysalis. And it, 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 I'm not going to say reinvent because it's not reinventing. It's just recreating. It's mm. changing. As you say, it's evolving. And I, I'm a big believer in midlife beginnings purely because I am one and I advocate it to everyone else that, you know, anything is possible. And I, I used to use the phrase that it's never too late to be what you might have been. But having understood now the NLP behind our language, when you say things that are in the negative sense, you, you all you hear is it's too late. So you yeah. don't hear that it's never too late. So I have to reframe that and say, you know, we can do whatever we want, you know, from whatever point. But it has to be that we want to do something. And this is what I find with a lot of people is they don't know what they want. Mm, yes, very much so. And and. You know, a lot of people never spend any time on personal development. And, you know, although I'm a coach and a mentor, I have a fantastic mentor, you know, who questions me and challenges me and keeps me moving towards my goal. And I think that's so important because it's all too easy, particularly in challenging times that we're going through now, just to retreat and go, do you know what, I'll just wait until we come out the other side and, you know, then I'll think about where I want to go. Um, but when you're working with somebody who can ask you those questions and challenge you and and help you to see that you have all that potential inside you, that makes such a massive difference. But unfortunately, a lot of people just don't do it. They live their whole life just thinking they've got to figure everything out themselves. Um, and that is limiting in itself because other people have got different perspectives, experience, wisdom, and they can really stretch you. Um, on that note, I've recently done uh, a couple of weekends ago, I did a TEDx and uh, the subject of the TEDx was fearless. And I was talking about becoming more significant, but I was talking very much about fear. And my acronym for fear is feel, emotion and rise. So, you know, I, I what I talk about is, is being in your comfort zone and how the brain's role is to keep us safe. And the minute the brain gets any sense of fear, it goes into the fear response, as you know, you know, the adrenaline, the rapid heart rate, the dry mouth, the sweaty palms. And that will then give us all the reasons why we shouldn't step out of the comfort zone or try and draw us back in because it wants us to stay where it's safe and familiar. 
And when we're stretching out of that comfort zone, it will feel scary because it's unfamiliar and the brain will go through all that fear response. So it's important to register that we're feeling the fear. I don't think we should be stuffing it down and just pushing through and pretending it's not happening. Register that we're feeling the fear, but then welcome it because when you're scared, it means you're stretching. And when you're stretching, it means you're growing. And you know, self-actualization is all about growth and it's one of our basic needs. So welcome that. And I always say to people, if you haven't been scared regularly, you're sitting in the sea of complacency that is your comfort zone. And ultimately that's going to become so dissatisfying. Um, and the only thing that grows in, in um, the comfort zone is dissatisfaction and waistlines. And let's face it, none of us want that, Amy. So was that your first TEDx there, Sylvia? It was, yes. Yeah. And how did you feel standing on that red dot? Well, unfortunately, I couldn't go because it was in Glasgow and we were in lockdown. It was the 22nd. So I had to record it from home. But what it made me do was up my game. So hence the Logitech camera. Um, I've got some really good video lighting and um, it just got me pulling together a uh, um, impactful talk in 18 minutes which as you know for us speakers Amy is quite a challenge which much rather have 45 minutes or an hour than 18 minutes so it helped and of course they provide you with a mentor as well and even though you speak a lot you know having a mentor is brilliant because they just pick up those bad habits that we all have that we don't realize we have so it was a really good experience and uh, yeah I'd love to do it for live next time that would be great. And with the TEDx, obviously, you've got the time limit of 18 minutes. And some TEDx talks have now even been reduced to 12 minutes, which is even yeah. harder. And how did you decide your topic? Well, everything I'm doing right now is all around this becoming more significant. So basically, I mind mapped it, you know, great big sheets of paper, mind mapped it. What did I want to include? And then pulling it together in a format, practicing it, timing it and thinking, nope, that's way too long. What am I going to take out? So it was a process of elimination, right? What needs to stay in and what needs to come out? Because I wanted to tie in the topic of fear as well in there. But fear is very much a big part of becoming more significant because that's what stops us stretching and coming out of our comfort zone. So it actually fitted really well. And I wanted to have the, the vulnerability of my story as well. So, but my story was too long. So I had to reduce the story and, and just tweak it in certain ways. But that in itself was a really good discipline because it made me put the really salient points in and not fill it with any kind of filling words, not repeat things too much and all that kind of thing. It really made me be very, very uh, specific about the content. So that in itself was really, really good. I think the one challenging thing I found was, and you'll understand this, that when you're on stage in front of an audience, you really bounce off the energy of the audience. When you're in your study, which is where I was, delivering to camera on your own, it's difficult to re recreate that full energy. And I'm really passionate about my topic and that came through. However, I would have been more energized if I'd had a live audience there. And, and I'm sure you understand that. Absolutely. It, it does. It's not it's not the same. Being on Zoom does not, you know, be, is not like being in the room. Absolutely. If you had to share a story that you want to share now, as opposed to on celebrating your death, for example, what would your living legacy story be? I think it would be pushing through that fear of exposing my own story on stage and really, really realising that, boy, that made a difference. And I remember um, at the time I thought, I can't share my story on stage. It's not, you know, all these amazingly powerful speakers at the Professional Speaking Association who've got incredible stories, they're going to be bored. So actually I shared it when I was running a workshop um, on how to develop a more powerful personal presence. And it just happened to be all women that were on this workshop and they'd known me quite well because at the time I was running business networking groups and most of them were members of my group. So they saw me every month. And when I shared that story, honestly, you could have heard up a pin drop there was just this wow and we had a break afterwards and the number of women that came up to me and said 
I just no idea that you'd been through that. You always seem so confident, so well put together, so you know, so strong. And I'd no idea that you know you had once been felt so insignificant. And one of them was in that position now. One of them had just left a really difficult marriage, and and one of them was um, in a, a business where the boss was a real bully. And they both said, you know what? That's just given us such strength to know that you were there, and to see where you are now. It just gives us hope that we can do that as well. So I just, after that, I thought, wow, I can still feel the emotion I felt at the time because it was just, I didn't realize it would have that impact. And doing that then gave me the courage to share it in front of the Professional Speaking Association. So, you know, that really helped me to do it and it helped them. And I think it's a really important point is that you don't have to have a big trauma or, or a big event to be able to capture an audience and speak to them mm -hmm. and speak to, you know, how they're feeling. And as you say, it's, it's sort of talking to that one person. It doesn't have to be the entire audience. But you're, you're literally talking to one person. Exactly. And if you make a difference, if you create that difference in that one person, then that is mission accomplished. Yes, it is. And I think, you know, somewhere like, the professional speaking association. I know I keep mentioning it, but it's it's just quite relevant. You know, when you go along for the first time and you hear some of the phenomenal speakers and you hear about, you know, where they speak and the size of audience they speak in front of, it can feel incredibly daunting. And I know that a lot of newbies come along and they go, I'll never stand on that stage. I'll never stand in front of those speakers. I don't want to be critiqued. You know, I might come from time to time, but I'm not sure I belong here. And, you know, I think that's really sad because it takes all levels of speakers, as you say, not just the ones that are speaking to hundreds of people or thousands of people and earning a fortune. It's also the ones that speak to small audiences and have a real impact. The ones that have everyday stories, as well as the ones that have those mega stories. And, you know, everybody's got a place there and everybody's got a voice. And it's about accepting people at all levels and supporting people at all levels and helping them to share that story and that voice. That's the important thing. And I'll give you an example of a small story, but how for me, it means everything. I, I was in the supermarket sort of back in the first lockdown and I didn't go out very much, but I was behind somebody in a queue and she carefully laid everything out onto the, onto the top there. And, and the lady was checking things through and she gave her the number of what it was going to cost at the end. And you saw this sort of wave of panic over the lady's face and you knew that she wasn't going to be able to afford what she. So then she was looking at those items thinking, well, what is it I'm not going to have? And she didn't have very many things. And I just looked at her and I just and I just gave her the money because I just felt that mm. to, be, to have that decision and that way up, you know, am I going to lose the apples or am I going to lose that chicken? And you just, it, for me, it was just, you know, a simple act that I could make a massive difference. Yeah. Wow. And again, so that's not a big story. That's not being mm -hmm. up Everest. But what does yeah. that show you? What can you share in that, in that story in, in a space with other people? It's, so don't take, you know, things that you do for granted and mm -hmm. be able to relay every moment to other people. It's really powerful. Absolutely. And, you know, that just that little act of kindness will have made such a difference to her. And I bet she's still talking about it, Amy. And not only does it make her feel good, it make I bet you felt really good about that as well. That, you know, that that double whammy of the oxytocin that flows between you when when yeah. you're doing something like that. It's just amazing. And, you know, a lot of people through lockdown have found that, um, you know, that, that just helping people out, doing shopping for elderly neighbours and all that sort of thing. It's really given them a sense of purpose. And as we as we spoke right at the beginning, we all need to have a sense of purpose in life. And it doesn't have to be a big why. This is this is what I, you know, the whole purpose on focus on why is simply why do we do what we do? And that doesn't mean in terms of what is our life mission. It, mm. it is, you know, the simple daily things to do and you know, lending some well, not lending someone, but giving someone just a few pounds. You know, for me at that moment, it it would meant you know, a small amount, but to someone else, that was huge. Yes. And and this is the thing, you know, just because you, you, you don't necessarily uh, sort of, it may not mean as much as to you, but it will be huge to other people. And, and a putting this podcast out and sharing people's stories, you know, each episode that's come on, I know at some point, someone will have listened to that, and it will mean everything to them. 
Mm. And, you know, it's not for me, it's not just another podcast I put out. It, it, I know that that's going to create a ripple effect, even if I never hear. Yes. And I might never know. Yes. And it doesn't matter mm. because I know that sharing your story today, someone somewhere will have the strength to break away from a relationship that they're not happy in where they're feeling that they've been belittled mm. and that they've been made to feel small. Absolutely. And, and that is enough to know to share the episode. Yeah, and it's brilliant. I love the title, Focus on Why. It's, it's, it's absolutely brilliant what you're doing. And uh, well done you. And you're you're all over the world, aren't you? Which is fantastic. <laughs> you knew, yeah. yeah. Isn't that fabulous? I mean, this is the thing about a podcast is that, you know, I am sitting here in my home office and I woke up with an idea and I just put it out. That, you know, I didn't I didn't have a plan really for it. I know my whole strap line is have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why. But when I say I didn't have a plan, I knew what I needed to do to get it out there. I knew how to launch the show. I knew what I needed to do to, to get the message there. But I didn't know how it was then going to be taken or received. That was just going to be led by the audience. And I, every day I look at my news feed on, on various social media channels and someone else has shared a story or they've shared a post about the podcast and what they've done. And, you know, I, I, that's, that is everything to me that other people are sort mm-hmm. of taking it upon themselves. Yeah. And, and that's the thing, you know, it is, it's not mine. It's not my podcast. It's everybody's podcast. And it's there for everyone as a, as a resource to share. And that's you living your legacy which is fabulous and seeing the difference it's making right now. And and isn't that thrilling? And that spurs you on to keep going and and do more and, and, you know, attract more people on that can really help your listeners, which is fantastic. So brilliant. Love it. Well, you know, it's been it's been so lovely hearing your story, Sylvia. And and I know that people will want to reach out to you. So what's the best way for them to, to get hold of you? It's really easy. It's sylvia at sylviabaldock.com or my website is sylviabaldock.com and all my contact details and social media are on there. So um, yeah, connect with me. Love to get to know you. Fantastic. And when is the book going to be launched? I think it's probably going to be about March. Um, the the draft has gone to the publishers, but I know that I've got um, a little bit of tweaking to do and we've still got to design the cover. So um, I would think probably March. Well, I wish you all the best with the new book. It's going to, I'll make sure I put it into the show notes once it's there and it's launched. Thank you. Add it in. Thank you. If for people who are listening to this beyond March, because this, this is actually the last day of December that this podcast is out. So you, you are the final note for 2020. Yeah. Which, <laughs> <laughs> and it, it's been a crazy roller coaster for a year, but we know we've, we've made it. Yes. Brilliant. Well done. And thank you again for coming on the show. Do you have any final words for the audience, please? Well, do you know, when we when we come to the end of a year, we think about the year ahead. One of the things that, you know, I'm planning next year is to make 2021 the year of significance. So, you know, I just want to repeat that wonderful quote. Don't worry about being successful. Work towards becoming significant and the success will naturally follow you know you all have your own unique brand of magic just be confident enough to share it because your magic will have an amazing impact on other people so 2021 your year to become more significant thank you for listening to the focus on why podcast i'm amy rowlandson and if you've enjoyed this episode please leave me a five-star apple podcast review Connect with me on LinkedIn, Instagram and Facebook and become a member of my inspiring, uplifting and positive Focus on Why Facebook group. I help people to focus on their why with clarity, uniting their passion with their purpose with a plan to create the life they truly desire. If you would like me to help you focus on your why, then please book a free 20 minute coaching call via candidly.com forward slash Amy Rowlandson. And if you haven't already, please sign up for the Friday Focus weekly newsletter via my website, amyrowlandson.com. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why.